Welcome to the second installment of The Grace of Uncertainty, The Journey from Dogma to Agnosticism. And that's the tentative title. In this episode, I would like to scope out the chapter that I'm going to call The Church's Credibility Gap, or maybe simply The Credibility Gap. We all suffer from credibility gaps at moments in our life when we make choices or make conscious decisions that show a distinction between what we preach with our words and what we do with our actions or the way we walk the talk. Now, in the first chapter of the book, The Church's Credibility Gap, I hope to outline several areas in which I have come through the eyes of the questioner using the book, The Sacredness of Asking Questions, of Questioning Everything by David Dark, using that as my my lens through which I now look at church history, which, you know, strangely enough, and I'm sure most Christians do this, we sweep the inconsistencies or the problems under the carpet of faith. And we say things like, please be patient with me. God isn't finished with me yet. Or words to that effect saying, you know, it's a journey. It's a process. We aren't made perfect the way we are going to be in heaven here on earth. We try our best or we try or we don't try. But every time we hit the we try our best, we don't try or we give up. That becomes part of the mounting evidence for the credibility gap. And specifically in church history, I I really started to wonder about all the moments, the great moments that I had studied as historical events or trends, but always said, yeah, well, there's enough of the good guys doing the good stuff, the right stuff, the right things that you could sort of excuse the history and say, well, uh, is it Angela Mayu or Dr. Phil who says, when we know more, we'll do better? Well, how much more do we need to know? If the 66 books of the Bible are the finished word of God, divinely inspired, infallible, inerrant, then you don't need any more. So what are you waiting for? And that is the question in the chapter that I call the credibility gap. So let me go over some of the things that are bothering me of late that I used to sweep under the carpet of faith and say, please be patient. God isn't finished with us, myself, anyone anymore. And look at some of the problems that have uh, developed over time. I'm thinking specifically of starting with a quote from Gandhi, (laughs) which I was not familiar with until I, I started poking around this thing. I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And there is the essence of the credibility gap. The Christians are unable to walk the walk of Jesus. Now, there are exceptions, of course. There are the Mother Teresas. There are the people that the Roman Catholic Church has traditionally um, beatified and, and made into saints. Exceptional people. At exceptional times, there is no doubt that there are some of those sprinkled just enough to say it is possible when I'm questioning whether it truly is for the average follower of Christian Christianity. So starting off with Gandhi, I do not like your Christians and poking around history. I found Bishop Spong, an ecclesiastical clergyman who recently passed away, an American indicating something along the lines of, I think this is a quote, the church has come out on the wrong side of political and social change, preferring to defend status quo when injustice demanded change. Or words to that effect, I think it's from a presentation actually Bishop Spong made in Toronto, my hometown, in 2005, well, I had exited the building at, by that point, I think. Um, so anyway, there, there are some, those are quotes to sort of dangle in front and say, 
there's a problem, and I'm going to call it the credibility gap. And you can check out the people that I refer to as I go through this stuff. Remember, this is just an outline of things that I'm writing about and thinking about and poking around. How about, I've already mentioned this, I think, in my introduction, the Divine Red of Kings, that great Magna Carta, the UK tradition, the British tradition of reigning in the absolute authority of the king, who up until that point claimed divine right, divine authority. Well, who would back that up? Well, it makes sense. The church would, after all. The the uh, pope would be the one who would give the power, the divine authority to the various kings of kingdoms throughout Europe. So having a vested interest in status quo doesn't seem to really play well with a crowd. At least that's the way I'm thinking. How about slavery? We all know that there were Christians involved in overturning the slave trade and turning the slave trade movement around. We know of people involved in the British side of things. And we know of the great story of Amazing Grace, the song, and the slave trader. And I believe it was Newton who wrote the hymn and who was a reformed slave trader. So we celebrate those stories of transformation of, I once was blind, but now I see. The trouble is that these things are usually forced upon people. It's not like You know, the slave trade hadn't always been going on. Slave, making slaves of one another, it's a biblical concept. Not that it's promoted in the Bible, but it's there. And it was not overturned or cast out. Jesus did not preach against it specifically, but then Jesus didn't preach against a lot of things that were wrong at that time. And we're not sure why. But he gave us general rules that we should follow. And along those general rules are treat your neighbor as yourself. And if you would enslave your neighbor, enslave yourself, then now if you don't mind doing that, then by all means have a slave yourself because you are saying you don't mind being a slave. Well, you have only to walk two moons, walk in someone's moccasins for two moons before you find out. Um, that that is not a pleasant place to be. And we've tried to modify the word slavery to say servants in some biblical translations. And so the history of the church is one of trying to say something uncomfortable. You know it's not good. You know it's not right. You know perhaps that it's even not true. But because the Bible doesn't tell you so You have to stick to the history. And I'm saying, no, you don't. Stare at the history. If it doesn't fit what you know to be true from your beliefs about the Bible, then time to change it up. Maybe change what you believe. So slavery, and then the uncomfortable truth in church history, that it was condoned, accepted, not promoted, but condoned and accepted by the church for so long since the time of Jesus. And Jews were forbidden to make other Jews slaves, but they could make slaves of other people. That's the Old Testament. Okay, did we get any better in the New Testament? I think Paul wanted to return a slave to its owner and said, treat him better. But that's about as far as we got. That's progressive revelation. That's God's view on things, that's in the Bible? Well, time to start asking some serious questions. Okay, that's slavery. Um, Most of the anti-slavery movement was within a branch of Protestantism, the liberal branch of Protestantism. And that was spurred on more by liberalism, enlightenment, the French Enlightenment, These are non-church-related movements, the movement of thought. In fact, the church sometimes got in the way of enlightenment. So I'm wondering whether the notion of the anti-slavery movement being rooted in the gospel and reformed Protestantism is really an accurate statement. And you can agree or disagree with that. That's just what I'm poking around and thinking about. 
Uh, how about bringing it right up to some contemporary issues and say that where is the church on climate change? And we could again point to the liberal Protestants who are all over the green movement. But then you have to ask the question, well, where is everybody else? I mean, if Jesus died for everybody and everybody's a Christian who professes the name of Jesus, then where's everybody else in the camp on climate change? So there's a big credibility gap there. In fact, many, uh, many businesses, maybe churches in the southern United States especially, come out in opposition and preach actively and teach actively against climate change. Why? Well, probably because it's linked to spurious science, anti-science movements within the uh, evangelical community. It's a tough one, tough nut to crack when you're trying to challenge science, but then you really have to. If you're going to follow Bishop Usher in the 4004 BCE date for creation and take it all literally, you've got some serious problems. And so you have to tackle science and what science is saying. And those who choose to face the science and face what I would call the facts of science, you've got some hard things that you've got to reconcile. And maybe they're not possible to be reconciled. I don't know. The day age thing is one of those ways we try to accommodate those within the evangelical church who say, well, I got to be true to the Bible. It says six days and seventh he rested. So is it days literal? Is it epochs or eons? I don't know. So you say, well, it could be eons. That accommodates the evolutionary timelines very well. So you got to take all this stuff and stare at it and say, well, if I'm going to be a Christian, I better start dealing with all the inconsistencies of my position or my church's position, my denomination's positions, my particular brand of Christianity, my brand of faith. If it's not Christian, I got to take all this stuff into consideration. Not that science is always right. I'm thinking it's just that you got to stare at what is known. And the scientific method has taken us so far, it'd be a shame to wash that away. So that's the key in climate change. What about other issues? Voting rights? How about women in the glass ceiling? How about the treatment of blacks? Do black lives matter? Do all lives matter? How you answer that really depends on where you're coming from. And what about the treatment of First Nations in North America? The Canadian uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission is trying to deal with and ask the tough questions, but they are not always making the progress that they need to do. And all the recommendations from that have not come out as quickly as we would like to see in terms of change. How about human rights in general? How about the affirmation of human rights? Um, how about disasters like Rwanda, the genocide? Where's the church on all of these issues? And if you're going to talk about the church and those kinds of social issues, you got to talk about racism and the defense of racism in the Christian church, especially in the 20th century. Why was it necessary for Martin Luther King Jr. to have the walk to Selma? What was going on that needed that? And it turns out that a lot of the church was part of the racist South. So the credibility gap is incredibly profound, and you need to take it all into consideration when you are choosing to espouse a faith that has all of these things, like skeletons in a closet or like dust under the carpet. You've got to be able to stare at those things and ask the questions. The questions are so important. Well, I'm going to leave it at that and just, you know, say that there are credibility gaps when it comes time to unions, child labor, approaches to gender, bias, exclusion, LGBTQ rights, women in the church, education, treatment of immigration, of immigrants, your views towards immigration are all places where you can have potential for great change or you could remain with status quo, sweep it all under the carpet and Nothing to see here, folks. I'm thinking it's time to start asking the hard questions in all of these areas. And that is what I'm focusing on as I delve into 
the church's credibility gap. Thanks for listening. Hope there will be another one regarding the other chapters. Each one is just an overview of what I'm thinking and writing as I go. Take care now. Bye-bye.